Okay, welcome everybody to our talk this afternoon. It's actually good to see um, a very healthy crowd. I was mildly worried given the time of the day and the fact that it's a Monday. So I welcome all of you here. My name is Michelle Teo and I'm the Deputy Director at the Middle East Institute. We're really very happy to have um, Ari Shavit here today. Um, Liat, who's from the Israeli Embassy, and I were talking about this. We've been trying to do something, some kind of cooperation between the, the Embassy and the Institute, I think for quite a long time and never quite happened. So I'm very, very glad about this today. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about our guest and about the book that he has, has written. Um, uh, Ari's book, My Promised Land, has, re has actually received some very, very good reviews. And um, I had a quick glance at, um, you can find it on PDF online. So I read a little bit of it, and I think I'd like to try and read the whole book. But it is wonderful because it really tells the story of Israel as a nation from the perspective of an individual. It is about the people and it is about the nation. So I'm hoping that in this talk today, uh, when Ari um, uh, speaks about it, um, that uh, he, you know, we, we really look at it, view it from the perspective of the history of a people and quite an ancient people as well. Um, there will be politics, I'm sure. I hope it just doesn't get focused on that solely, but we look beyond that to look at at, at the history of this nation and the history of these peoples. Um, uh, he, he, I'm not gonna tell you what he's gonna talk about because Ari will explain that himself, but he's got, some, he's got some ideas about how he'd like to approach this. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. A little bit about Ari himself. Here's where my age shows itself because I've taken off my glasses. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, his, in his, his background, he has actually been a columnist for Haaretz, uh, which is um, actually a newspaper that I personally quite like. Um, doesn't pull its punches. So I think we will have that as well today, I hope so, because you, you have a reputation for being outspoken, Ari. So <laughs> um, and uh, I hope we'll get a, he, he will speak for a little bit, and then we will open up the floor to questions or discussions. Um, I'd like it to be free-flowing. Uh, you can be controversial, but let's not get bogged down in, in too much of that, because I think we want to look beyond that. And I'd really encourage us to have that discussion, to look beyond the politics, to really look at, look at the story that is being told, the narrative that is being told, because it is an interesting narrative. So I hand over to you now, Ari. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, uh, I've come to Singapore over a week ago, and uh, my original plan was not to speak at all. This is a period that i have taking to do some deep research, uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about it, but when the invitation came, I said I cannot say no to such an invitation. Um, I must tell you that um, the week I had here uh, transformed my approach to Singapore from uh, appreciation to admiration. Um, I'm re rather thrilled by um, what I saw and learned in a very, very uh, intensive week of learning that I had. And as a result of that, being an Israeli, I'll improvise a bit, and I'll not speak exactly uh, about uh, in, in the way that uh, the, the lecture was, was, was the, the, according to the original idea, because I'll really try to begin with the promised land and getting to peace afterwards. Uh, so I, in this sense, I will go back to my book and my approach to the Israeli story, because wherever I went here, uh, I kept thinking about the astonishing similarity an astonishing contrast between Israel and Singapore. So I will not be speaking much about Singapore, perhaps you'll, you'll do that, but uh, I will want in a short time we have to speak a bit about the Israeli story um, and then leading us uh, to the question of peace, past, present, and future. 
Israel, let me just one say one, one, one other word. Uh, I'll be speaking from an Israeli perspective because I'm an Israeli, but obviously, as I do throughout my life, bearing in mind and thinking about the other people of the land, the Palestinians, and other others. So it is an Israeli perspective, but the perspective of an Israeli who really cares about his neighbors and tries not to ignore them on the contrary, to appreciate them, think about them, and work with them. Uh, the other point is that it's a personal perspective. Unlike some of our distinguished guests, I don't work for the Israeli government. I was not sent by the Israeli government. I have serious disagreements with the Israeli government. So I'm here, whatever I say here, I say it as an Israeli, but as a personal Israeli, not an official representative of anyone. I hardly, barely represent myself. Like Singapore, in my mind, Israel is a man-made miracle. I'm not a religious person. I hope I have God in me, but I don't believe he intervenes and handles our affairs. But when I look at the Israeli phenomena, just as when I look at the Singaporean phenomena, I see something that is astonishing. I would say that in a sense, if Singapore is a phenomenon of a meritocracy against all odds. Israel is a phenomenon of vitality against all odds. So if we are to try to look into it, what is it that makes this Israeli triumph, which I've tried to read about in my book? To try to make a very complex, long story, simple and short, I'll say that the first layer of the Israeli triumph is the astonishing insight that our founding fathers and mothers had over 100 years ago. To be exact, 120 years ago. We are now celebrating the 120th year of the Jewish national movement. 120 years ago, in April of 1897, my great-grandfather arrived in the port of Jaffa. Unlike most Jews of his time, my great-grandfather happened to be a privileged, successful Jew. It's quite, quite familiar nowadays. It was not that familiar in Britain of the late 19th century. He was really lucky. So when I began going, writing my book, going on that long tour of self-discovery, I asked myself, the first question I asked myself, is why a Victorian gentleman who had it all, success, wealth, respect, why should he leave Britain, London, that was the capital of the world in every respect, and travel to the remote, desolate province Palestine was? One of the founders of our movement, Chaim Weizmann, used to say you don't have to be crazy to be a Zionist, but it helps. And my great-grandfather's journey from London to Jaffa seemed to be crazy. I don't want to make far-reaching comparisons, but when I saw your landing point and the statue of, amazing statue there, I had some thoughts of some comparison in mind, although it's a completely different story. But it's the same kind of, there, there are some similarities in there. But my great-grandfather and Herzl, whom he vo who worked for, who was the visionary of the State of Israel, and those founding fathers and mothers, were not crazy. They were brilliant. They realized 
that Europe is becoming a death trap to its Jews. Now we have to remember history because there is so much distortion with people trying to see Zionism as colonialism and Israel as some invention of white Christian Europe. The real truth is that the Jews were the ultimate other of white Christian Europe for 1,500 years. They were treated like dirt. They never knew where they'll be next year. They never knew where the next pogrom will strike. But these amazing gentlemen and ladies who created the national movement of the Jewish people realize that the ultimate other is about to become the ultimate victim. They didn't know there would be a Holocaust. No one could have envisioned Auschwitz and gas, gas chambers and these horrible trains. But they saw the trends in nationalistic, racist Europe, including France, that was the capital of enlightenment, and Germany. And they realized that if we don't act quickly, we'll die. So faced with the most amazing challenge that people can be faced with, the challenge of extinction, they came up with the most audacious, crazy idea one can think of. And in this sense, Israel is the outcome of an astounding revolution. Because unlike other revolutions, they just guarantee political, social rights and liberties. It was a revolution that saved a people that was about to die at the very last moment by doing something quite phenomenal transferring it from one continent to another, taking a country, building a nation, reviving an ancient language. So the insight, the genius to see when I look at my present leaders sometimes in Israel, who can hardly think beyond yesterday, and definitely beyond tomorrow, when I think of the kind of thinking and the combination of analysis, vision, determination, imagination. It's quite incredible. The second layer of the Israeli triumph is our, or I would say the first third of the 20th century, especially from 1909, 1910 on. Because basically by the, that time, the leaders of the movement have realized that we face a unique situation, a unique condition. And they realize that in order to deal with it, you must come up with unique solutions. If this rings familiar, so be it. So what they had, which again, sadly, we don't have these days, was incredible, incredible social innovation. In order to do, to make this impossible project work, they created a series of institutions and policies that were absolutely unique. So I want to get into all of it, but the balance, the fundamental balance with, between two attitudes the first one was democratic socialism. Even the liberals, the middle class, the bourgeois leaders realized that the only way this can work is with the collective endeavors. So they created the famous kibbutz, supported by the national movement. You had the kind of utopian revolutionaries building a democratic community with the support of the national movement which is what made it so incredible. And you had this Tadut, which is this major trade union that owned so much of the country and for the public good. And you had Chevrat HaOvdim, the people's um, uh, company or co company that, that the, work, the workers' uh, 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 you know, capital and, and, and endeavor that enabled people to work within the context of a collective effort. And again, if some of these institutions ring a bell, 
Perhaps it has to do with the fact that Dr. Goh traveled to Israel in 1959 and saw some things he very much liked. But the incredible things about this was this kind of commitment of people who came from other countries, from a different life, to leave behind religion and tradition and sometimes a comfortable life and to begin totally anew while creating all these like 10, 12, 15 different kind of organizations dealing with health, economy, agriculture, social life, political life that were totally unique inventions again, and if this rings familiar, after they studied a lot, all kinds of social experiments in Denmark and Holland and other countries, they didn't live, they didn't take it all from the Old Testament. But they combined the thinking of the time with the understanding that this is a unique situation they had to deal with. But there was another side. If there was the social, socialist kind of collective heroic side, at the very same time, there was an understanding that without capital, without a free market, without entrepreneurs, this project won't work. So while you had the kibbutz on the one side, I described a specific kibbutz called in Harod, in Idris North, you had the amazing Jaffa orange groves created by private sector in, in, in owners and, and entrepreneurs. And you had the booming Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was at that time a mini megalopolis. It was 50,000 people, 100,000 people, but it had all the energy that we know about Tel Aviv of today. So you had this kind of a balance of a revolutionary ethos and unique institutions that went with it with a kind of pragmatism and a life, a love for life and understanding of human nature that prevented us from becoming another Soviet Union. So the balance between these two arms is what made the incredible success of the first phase, which was basically, again, from, 19, oh, from the beginning of the 20th century to 1935. Then comes 1936. This already has to do with the conflict. In my mind, 1936 is the most important year in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Because in April of that year, for whatever reasons, begins what we call the Great Arab Revolt. Arabs, Palestinian, just defined Palestinian. The Palestinian movement, national movement, actually appears for the first time as an established, mature body. So there is horrible violence throughout the country. The, worst in, the first incidents are in the very same Jaffa that my great grandfather came to, and that the orange groves were sent from, the orange, oranges were sent from to, to Britain. And there was a terrible wave of violence with kind of lynching in April of that year. And then there is ongoing, like, horrible violence engulfing the entire country. Villages being burned, people murdered. For us, definitely that time, mass killing throughout the country, total state of chaos. And what this means, that within a few months, what was a utopian, idealistic movement has to transform to itself and to adjust to an ongoing state of war. If there is an Israeli IDF that has some impact on Singaporean history and present, it's because of those months. Because within a very short time, we realize that our original plan won't work. The kibbutz dream, this kind of hippies, the flower children that are going to make justice and build a nation while helping humanity, that's not what's going to happen. We have to become soldiers. We have to become warriors. And the incredible ad ability to adapt to this tragic situation gives, in my mind, kind of inspiration, although it's such a tragic deed. It's a very sad development, but the people are dealing with it with, it, with a kind of intellectual and personal carriage. And basically within a few years, first of all, the first reaction is the one I like 
best is be before we become violent, is we build the Tel Aviv port. Because what happens is the Palestinians have all, all the exports and imports are through Jaffa. You are a port state, port city, and port civilization. You realize the importance of a port. And our port is suddenly shut. We are, we are suffocated. So we build a port within a month in an impossible location, in impossible circumstances. And in my mind, that, that's like the great, greatest example of Israeli resilience and adaptability to a totally, total crisis, which is about to kill us. And then we do something else. We begin to build this kibbutzim in a very, like, manufactured way overnight, like fortresses. We turn them fortresses. We call them the tower and fence settlements or kibbutzim. So we adjust very quickly in a kind of peaceful, it's like a peaceful response to a, a dramatic strength, but then war is going on. So we build all the institutions that later will create the idea. The Haganah, the Palmach, the Israeli, uh, we, we actually begin to manufacture rifles and bullets when we don't have independence yet. Israel has a supreme command to its defense forces nine years before it has a state. Nine years before the state is formed, there's already a central command. So what we do is we adjust to this terrible turn of events, and we change. And one of the things that we do, and I have a chapter about this, is we send our youngster to Masada, to this great fortress in the desert, in order to prepare them for a terrible war that is inevitable. The fourth layer of the Israeli triumph happens just after the 48 war in the 1950s. And for me, it is the one that, that I was mostly surprised by while writing the book. Because I knew about the amazing things of, that I just told you about in a general way. What I didn't realize, how much civilian heroism Israel had in the 1950s. Now, it's a bit more difficult to talk about this in Singapore than in any other place in the world because you've done similar wonders. When I speak in America, I say to Americans, imagine America having to absorb 400 million immigrants in three and a half years while building a Congress, a White House, a Supreme Court, an army, an FBI, a CIA. This is not humanly possible. Israel did that. We were 650,000 people, and in three and a half years, we absorbed 700,000. Within less than a decade, we absorbed over a million. Now, it's not only the numbers. Who are these people? Half of them, roughly speaking, were refugees from the Arab world who lost everything overnight. We talk, we should talk, and we will talk today about the Palestinian refugees. But there were so many Jewish refugees who were kicked out of their homes in Cairo, in Baghdad, in Libya, throughout the Middle East. But we didn't keep them in refugee camps to rot. With all the difficulties, and there, was, there were very bad mistakes done in the way they were treated, but with all the problems, we did make every effort to enable them to have decent housing and, and homes and, and work within a reasonable time. And who are the other half of the people? The survivors of the Holocaust. People with numbers tattooed into their arms. People with nightmares at night. People who lost in many cases, their first family just 10 years ago, and now we're creating new families, trying to forget that they lost their other children. These people who were the ultimate victims of the 20th century had every reason to become suicide bombers. They had every reason to concentrate on going to Stuttgart and München and poison the wells or bomb buses. But they didn't. They decided that their revenge will be to choose life. And within a very short time, we built a health system that is better than the one we have yet now. We built an education system that is better than the one we have now. 
and we build housing. And I went to look at the HDB project. I could not think of where the inspiration came from. Because in 1952, a third of our population were homeless. They lived in tents and huts. By the end of the 1950s, Israel had the highest rate of home ownership in the, in the industrialized world. Now, a lot of the housing was cheap, ugly, many mistakes, people were treated badly. A lot of, I can give you a long list of all the mistakes and, and, and sins. But it's an amazing endeavor. Because basically, what you went for is workplaces and homes. We had, first of all, we needed food. So first of all was agriculture. We built, we created three villages a week. Three villages a week. We tripled the number of villages we had within five years, just so we won't starve. Then we build these houses, 200,000 within a few years. Today, Israel, which is much richer, cannot give houses to its young people. But that Israel that was poor and besieged and was so much more effective in doing it. And then we went for industrialization because the original ethos was romantic agriculture and farming. We realized that won't work. And from the mid 50s on, we went into very intensive process of industrialization, which rather worked. There was one other element there, which I think is important. While doing all that, we realized and tell me if something ring, sounds familiar, that being a small besieged nation, we have only one asset, people, human capital. And we didn't call it human capital those days. So we realized that we must have the best education system possible. And while people had nothing to eat, we created some of the best universities. To begin with, we had one major university, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and within all this, we create the new universities. I'm now shooting a HBO documentary following my book. So a few, a year ago, I went to see my father's, my father was a scientist, I went to see his laboratory in the Weizmann Institute in Rehov. And I, it used to be chemistry, now it's mathematics. I walk into the lobby, and there was a funny looking machine at the entrance. So I asked them, what's this? They tell me, this is Yatsik. This is the fourth computer manufactured in the world in Israel in 1954. There's no housing, there's rationing. People eat three eggs a week, there's no meat but we build the fourth computer in the world. If not, that's not a man-made miracle, I don't know what a man-made miracle is. The fifth layer of the Israeli miracle is a very different one. It's the 1990s, 2000. I'm skipping over, but we can discuss it later, the fact that from the 70s on, we have a major politic, ongoing political crisis in Israel. And this is where I think the, comparison, the contrast is so interesting. You have such a strong state and civil service, we have lost our state and our civil service was neglected. So Israel, for many reasons, and we can discuss it later, from 1967, 73, 77, series of events, the, the controversy of a, the occupation, peace, the eternal divides, is very different from the original Israel, and in this sense, very different from Singapore. It becomes a very loose republic that is in many ways dysfunctional, and yet, within that context, in my mind, another miracle happens. So first, we have major immigration from the Soviet Union, 89, 90. It's not as dramatic as the 50s, but we still succeed in absorbing a million people who come over a year and a half, two years. The other thing that happens immediately after that is the eruption of the amazing high-tech genius, which also is relevant to Singapore in many ways. What basically happens there? To begin with, you had the bedrock of Yatsik, 
You had incredible genius in Israeli's universities and research centers. Then it went to the army. Because of the problem that we have, the, all the problems, the army made sure that we will have the best high-tech technology. So if Yatsik was the first one, the second computer was a great IBM computer in the Israeli Defense Forces back in the 56 or 57. And it went on and on. We developed all these elite units that are not just commandos, but are like brain commandos. And we, we nourished it all the time. Came the 80s and 90s, and the state was wise enough, and in an untypical way generous enough, to allow this talent actually to go out into the marketplace. I have a friend, I'm not a very wealthy guy, but I have a friend who's one of the three founders of Israel's greatest high-tech success. It's called Checkpoint. These three guys who started their business over 20 years ago, the military could have easily said, what are you doing? You're taking 70, 80 percent of what you're doing is actually things we had, you know, in-house in the Ministry of Defense, and you are making billions of them. They didn't. There was a very wise approach to allow young people to take their talent wherever they want to take it. You can say some of it was too much, but the result was a very wise policy that enabled all this talent that was locked in Israel to burst in this amazing. And today, it's the high-tech sector that is keeping Israel as such a successful nation. But there was another element that went with this that is more, more difficult to define with this element, which is that while in the old days, which are not that old again, but we are talking about two young nations, there was a lot of kind of collect, collective oppression and cultural oppression. And many minorities were treated badly. In this sense, we have a lot to learn from you. We didn't have the multiracial discipline that you have. So Sephardic Jews, Israeli Palestinians, Orthodox Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews, all these were treated rather badly. Not, I don't think, we can discuss it in a kind of, in, there was no bad intention, it wasn't, you know, catastrophic, but they were not part, an integral part of the elites, definitely. So what happened in all this dynamism and chaos of the 80s, especially 90s and 2000s, that all these different groups are liberated in many ways, and they have much more, they are empowered. And although it's not systematic and there is no policy and as I told you what I think about my government, and I can tell you more, and, and, but there is something amazing about a kind of collective wisdom. Israel, in this sense, is like greater than its parts and greater than its, its policies. And so it's not only while you have the absorption of, of, of the immigrants and the eruption of the high tech, it's within context of a celebration. Israel becomes a kind of celebration of diversity, of different identities, of it's, it becomes much more colorful and free, and that gives people amazing energy in economic energy, and ironically, without anyone planning it, this kind of flexibility gives Israel an advantage in today's world because it allows innovation and creativity. We are all about vitality and creativity. Again, not planned, without a political system running it, but it's an incredible Israeli achievement. Okay, but I'm not into whitewashing. So with the other, there was the other side. There is the triumph, and there is the tragedy. And the tragedy is the tragedy of the conflict. So in 1897, when my great-grandfather comes, he's blind to see that there are other people in the land. Now, it's not only his blindness, because the Palestinians are blind too. There's kind of mutual blindness of two people who would not see that they have to share the land between them. We don't see them. They don't see us. Then, later on, 
when the unique combination of revolutionary ethos and a pragmatic bourgeois ethos develops, we live in an illusion. We manage to live with the Palestinian neighbors, but we don't understand that we are not addressing their political wishes, and this, will un this is unsustainable. So the blindness and the illusion lead to the third element, which is the great catastrophe of 1948 for the Palestinian people. Again, if you'll ask more, I'm willing to get more into it later, but the context has to be understood. Israel, there was a UN resolution of partition having a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jewish community endorsed it with delight, with all the pain of dividing the land, people were willing to do it. The Palestinians totally rejected it, hoping and believing that they'll be able to get away with actually getting rid of us. And Arab, neighbor Arab armies invade us a few hours after the state is established in 1948. But because we prepared well for nine or 10 years, although we are small, we win the war. We win with the war because there was inherent weakness in Palestinian society because their elites were not committed to the, their people in the way that our elites were committed to our people. Because we organized and planned, so although we were at a historic and strategic disadvantage, we managed to turn it into uh, a war where we won. But the outcome was a lot of suffering, which in many ways goes to this, on to this day. Then in the 50s and 60s, when we were so busy building our nation in an incredible way, quite naturally, we went back to a kind of ignoring us, as if the, there are no Palestinians. And then when we woke up to see them, and we started a peace process in a rather courageous way in 1993, it totally failed. So this is the short history of the tragedy. So now let me be slightly political and say where I stand and what do I think. I'll begin with the end. There is no way but the two-state way. And there are two reasons for that. One is a moral one. You have the Jewish people and the Jewish Israelis who have a right of self-determination like any other people like any other nation, but definitely with our history, with what happened to us and with what might happen to us, that right is extremely, extremely important. I would say sacred. But the Palestinians have their right of self-determination too. So if you have two rights, both have to be addressed and respected, and the only way to do it is a two-state approach. The other reason there is no alternative to this two-state way is a practical one. The alternative to a two-state is one state. Now, you have an amazing success in your one-state solution. There isn't such an example in the Middle East. There aren't that many examples in the world altogether. We tried the one-state solution in a wonderful country called Syria. The outcome is a very harsh dictatorship that once it got weak, the result is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dead, millions of people losing their homes, and the world totally incompetent in dealing with this horrible human catastrophe, which is still going on as we speak. My friends in the Israeli intelligence tell me that they, when they see the Arab pictures of Syrian cities, they cannot help thinking about World War II and just don't understand these are like tough generals. And they say, we, are just, we cannot understand that the world allows this. This is one state solution. That's where one state's condition will end. You don't know who will die more. Palestinians or Israelis. But it's a recipe, there is no, I'm a rather 
open-minded person. I try to respect all opinions. I'm telling you, there is no way a one-state solution would not end in a horrible, horrible, historic, and human catastrophe. So we are, have to go for the two states. But the problem with the two states, the problem with the two-state solution is the word solution. There is no solution. The tragedy that I described briefly creates a situation that has no simple solution. The illusion that if we had a more generous Israeli prime minister, and I wish we would have a more generous Israeli prime minister, things will be better. That if we have a more imaginative Palestinian leader, we will have peace. That if we'll have a better convention in Camp David or Geneva or Sweden or Norway or some woods in Antarctica, then we'll find the formula that will end the conflict. It's unreasonable thinking. It's totally detached from reality. And I'm amazed to see some of my counterparts, my peers and friends on the Israeli left, and some people in the international community who still stick to ideas that have been refuted in such a way that are totally detached from reality. So, again, let's go into the history in a very short way. We tried this, no theory has been tried in recent memory so many times with such efforts like the two state, the old two state solution. We tried in 1993, it led to terror. We tried in 2000, it led to the horrible second intifada with suicide bombing 1,000 Israelis, 3,000 Palestinians getting killed. We pulled out of Gaza, we said it will become a Palestinian Singapore. It did not quite, you were invited to Gaza. It doesn't quite resemble Singapore. We tried it again in 2008, didn't work. Tried it in 2014, didn't work. How many times we will go, get, go, into that wall and not see that there is a wall there. From the Israeli point of view, every retreat leads to more terror. From the Palestinian point of view, every fake agreement leads to more settlements. The moderates, the extremists on both sides have veto power, and the moderates on both sides don't have enough willpower. How do you expect in such a situation to end the conflict in a week in a conference I said it when John Kerry was going around, and I said it, I pray, I pray there is a secret team in a secret basement in the State Department that plans Plan B. So now I plan that Mr. Kushner has a secret basement where he's planning Plan B. Because if they'll keep trying to do what was tried so many times, it will just end in tears, and it might even end in blood. What's the alternative? The fashionable thinking is about a regional solution. And there are some good reasons, because you are experts of the Middle East, to think, to think about that. Because never in history were so many moderate Arab leaders so close to Israel. And the real relationship, the intimate relationship between Israel and so many Arab nations has never been. We have both are worried about Iran, about extremism, and, and, and there is a lot of room for new kind of relationship, and things, amazing things are happening, in the last, especially in the last five years. But in my mind, the, the idea that that means that we can convene all the Arab leaders with the Israeli prime minister and have some sort of peace conference that will lead to a signed peace agreement is another, another illusion. Because the outcome of the Arab chaos of the last years is, again, the need of the leaders to work with Israel. But the outcome of the Arab chaos is that all Arab leaders are much weaker than their previous leaders were. They don't have the legitimacy. The two amazing peace agreements were achieved by two benevolent dictators, Anwar Sadat of Egypt, whom I admire, and King Hussein of Jordan, whom I love. No one in the Arab world today has the kind of power that they had. 
No one can impose such a difficult concession, a compromise, on the people. So on the one hand, Iran brings us closer, but at the same time, Iran makes the peace further because they know that the moment they'll go to Jerusalem, metaphorically speaking, or make any concession regarding Jerusalem, Iran and the extremists will endanger the earth. What can be done? In my mind, and I'll end with this, we have to replace the expectation for a formal peace with an expectation for a de facto peace. Between 1970 and 1994, Israel and Jordan had a very intimate relationship. We had 85% peace. King Hussein, when he came to Israel at that time, he did not go to the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. He stayed in the Mossad Villa in Herzliya. And sometimes when he wanted to go to the movies, he wore a fake mustache or a wig. But the relationship was intimate on every level. Defense, intelligence, development, you go to the Jordanian Jordan Valley and you see how similar it is to the Israeli Jordan Valley. It's not by coincidence. And they didn't steal our plans. So it was a very intimate relationship with no embassies and no ceremonies and no one got a Nobel Prize. I would give them a Nobel Prize, by the way. That, in my mind, is, should be the new paradigm. De facto peace. The second element, we have to understand it won't be final peace. It has to be gradual. Rather than have an idle peace process, let's have peace as a process. Third element, it won't be comprehensive peace. It'll be partial. You'll do step by step. You have to see what you can agree upon. Do that and not wait for the perfect to destroy the good. And the fourth element, it must not be excuse me, a politically correct piece, it has to be a pragmatic piece. If you just stick to principles and idea and statements that are said and repeated all the time by the international community, but no one in the Middle East believes them, no one, not the Arabs, not the Israelis, not the Palestinians, then it won't work. You have to work with the Middle East as it is and try to make the most out of it and improve it but not by coming from Brussels and imposing Brussels concepts that no one really shares. In my mind, the practical approach, I won't get into the details, it has to begin with an Israeli, the right kind of settlement freeze, which means not, unlike what President Obama demanded, not limiting it in time, but limiting it in space. We cannot do the whole thing, it has to be, we have to recognize that there are certain areas, where what we call the blocks, that the Palestinians recognized in the past, that building will go on, but in the rest of the West Bank, a total freeze forever. Then creating a Palestinian space that is, has a continuum that really allows almost all the Palestinians in the West Bank to live without seeing checkpoints and Israeli soldiers, but having a real space where they can develop their economy and build their nation. Then I, that won't happen if we won't have an international community intervening in the right way. Again, not by making some statements that are moralistic but unrealistic, but actually going, and here I think we have to learn something from Singapore, really going, chaperoning the parties into this hands-on process of nation building and, and a kind of martial plan to revolutionize the situation, not improve, revolutionize the situation both in the West Bank and in Gaza. And then hopefully, that I hope we can learn from what you did two years after your independence and really create a regional framework that I think in the first stage will not be a former one. It will be informal, unlike what you had. So all the, you really take the most you can from the affinity between so many Arabs in Israel now, combine it with American leadership, European leadership. I would love to have Asia, and specifically Singapore, as part with, with wisdom and talent and, and experience working within that framework. Because if you just leave it to the Israelis and Palestinians, it's highly likely that it won't work. So I think that if we follow that kind of process, and I'm open to any creative idea in that, but it has to be a new kind of thinking that is based on two things. One, the perfect won't happen, but two, change must happen. 
we have to change a trajectory. It has to be a different, we cannot maintain the present situation. I think, and I'll end with this, that we need to go this way because we owe it to the Palestinians. It is unacceptable that they will not have a place of their own. I think that we have to try it because we owe it to all the citizens of the Middle East, because the danger of instability and more violence is becoming more intense, and it will become, if we don't do something that makes things better, we might not be struck by violence next year, but when it does come, in five or ten years, it will be really ugly and worse than we have seen in the past. But again, on a personal note, as a Jew and an Israeli, I feel a deep commitment to do this. Not only because I care about my Palestinian brothers and my and cousins and my Arab neighbors, but because I owe to my children. We've done something so incredible. We've really created this man-made miracle with so much wisdom, sacrifice, talent, sanity, being reasonable, moderate, committed, and yet pragmatic. Right now we are endangering it all. So it's my commitment not only to others, which is very much, but for my own self-interest as a Jewish Israel and someone who loves Israel so much, to see that we begin marching on a new road that will be a long road and a difficult road, but I think eventually would lead us to a better future. Thank you very much.